Anyways, uh, to those of you that are joining us uh, today, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center at uh, Western Washington University. Um, this lecture, as a quick note, this lecture is going to be recorded and published online, so just keep that in mind. Um, the uh, ISC, if you're not familiar, it, it aims to foster an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technology. And the, um, the Internet Studies lecture series is presenting leading scholars and practitioners uh, whose work sort of challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. Um, a bit about today's speaker, uh, Sasha uh, Meinrath uh, is the uh, Palmer Chair of Telecommunications at Penn State University and is the former Vice President of the New America Foundation where he founded the Open Technology Institute in 2008 and co-founded the Future of War Initiative in uh, 2014. Uh, Sasha is an expert in community internet and technology policy with a special focus on rural and tribal broadband access. Um, he is also the co-founder of the Measurement Lab, a 100 million uh, broadband uh, measurement platform focusing on the accurately testing and monitoring of connectivity around the globe. He is author of over 100 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, white papers, and serves as a, a board member of the American Indian Policy Institute and the Brave New Software Foundation, among others. So uh, with that, welcome, Sasha. Very excited for your talk. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And since we are an intimate group, I would welcome folks to interrupt if you've got questions. I tend to have a very rapid fire presentation style. Uh, so I've got about 200 slides I'm going to go through in a shockingly short period of time. So if you're not paying attention, you're probably going to miss a bunch of information because what I'm saying and what I'm presenting often uh, interrelate. And I want to start with this notion that I think we've all heard before of technology and magic being kind of all in the eye of the beholder. For a lot of people, especially in DC, how technology works is like unknowable. And in terms of what I do, which I get a lot of questions about because I'm not really your normal academic and I'm not really your normal think tanker, uh, people may recognize this picture from the Wizard of Oz. And I would say that if I were to extend this metaphor, I am the most important character in the Wizard of Oz. In fact, the one responsible for pulling back the curtain and making known what is actually happening with the technology. That's right, I am the unsung hero uh, working in Washington, D.C. Some may call me a watchdog. I know, I know, it's terrible. Uh, and because I work in Washington, D.C., often I feel like things are just not working the way I wish they would. And this is to say that in D.C., we learn a story Right? We hear about you know, how democracy works and there's a bill and people debate it and the good ideas rise to the top and there's sort of this participatory deliberative process that makes all the sense in the world. But when you actually look at what's been happening in Congress, you would see that since World War II to today, we've seen an ever decreasing number of bills being passed. And it gets really bleak when you think about what it means for Congress to be, in essence, falling further and further behind upgrading rule of law to map onto everyday reality. Now, some would point to the 115th Congress, this is the last Congress, as saying like, oh, hey, things are looking good, right? That in fact, the 115th Congress was more productive than we'd seen in prior years. The problem is that that Congress was busy repealing laws that had been passed previously. So in the end, it's like matter and antimatter. We end up with basically no change, stagnation in our legal frameworks, especially around issues of technology and policy. 
And that, of course, favors a very particular group of powerful constituents. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The 116th Congress, as you all know, was a bit distracted, though it is shocking to see headlines like this. The bar is so low in terms of being not the least productive, but the 116th Congress has basically managed that. And here you can see the 115th Congress, actions are up. Of course, they're eliminating prior laws. 116th Congress, pretty much devoid of utility in terms of legislating any meaningful laws. And this leads to another one of my favorite author's quotes, which is, in essence, that society is progressing. Technology is increasingly in every facet of our lives. And yet our ability to keep up with that, well, let's just say that we're falling further and further behind. And this leads to what I call a gulf of ignorance in policymaking. So this is a joke that many of you will understand. But if I were to present this to Congress, I'd have a lot of people chuckle, but have no clue what the heck it actually means, which is to say even something as simple as binary is beyond the ken of the people making laws around computers and technology. So if we were to look at something, say, like this, where you've got this exponential trend and a linear trend, and we say, oh, OK, this exponential trend is like digital technologies mediated via the internet and the ever-increasing array of technologies that that entails. And the linear trend is basically Congress critters' ability to keep up. What you would see is over time this gulf that continues to grow exponentially in terms of the differential between people's understanding of what's happening in the world and what actually is transpiring in the world. Let me give you, I think, a really important example of this. So when Diane Feinstein was overseeing the NSA and people were first asking her, hey, like there's this crazy guy, Edward Snowden, he says like, there's these mass surveillance programs. Her answer on the record, this direct quote, right? I am not a high tech techie, but I've been told that is not possible. Which is to say she has no clue what is and is not possible with mass surveillance, even though she is singularly in charge of overseeing what the NSA is actually doing. That is awkward to say the least, but if you look at, this is a caricature of Sensenbrenner, who was the guy who supposedly drafted the Patriot Act, a 1400 page act that was introduced within 24 hours, um, who then later on came out saying like, I'm absolutely outraged that the NSA is using these powers in the bill that I wrote. And this too shows you how people didn't really understand the implications of the legislation they were passing, the Patriot Act being kind of the first amongst many. And the reason why this happens in many ways is that DC is a particular location. So here's the top 10 lawyers per populace around the United States. But when I throw in DC's numbers, you see that it is like an order of magnitude more lawyers per capita there, which is to say DC is completely inundated with lawyers. We are overrun with lawyers. That is not the case when it comes to technologists. When I created the Open Technology Institute in 2008, this is not ancient history, 2008, it was on this notion of like, hey, we've got to get technologists into the room when people are making decisions about technology. That was a radical new position just 12 years ago. Now, I would argue that we're at this moment, right, this danger opportunity where all of these digital technologies, all of these newfound capabilities, all this interconnectedness are all creating this perfect storm. And whereas we have the possibility of this really liberatory, exciting, empowering future, what we actually face when we're looking at the future is something quite different. That in essence, the ways in which we operationalize technology isn't what we dream of, but is something out of a dystopian novel 
and that that has become almost normative. So into this space, my work with the X Lab is sort of to, to gather together technologists to intervene in these policy circles in Congress, at the FCC, and other locations. When decisions are being made, we attempt, not always successfully, to infuse the deliberations with technological acumen. And what this looks like, as Dustin mentioned, yes, we created this Future of War initiative to talk about the cyber side of what that future looks like. And this move away from kinetic warfare into something else. And we continue to intervene in this notion that cyber attacks should be treated akin to radiological, biological, uh, you know, chemical attacks, not like something that is in essence, part of a theater of warfare, but something that tends to target civilian populaces and the, the soft underbellies of countries, and therefore should be, in essence, viewed with the same level of accountability and non-use. That is still, to this day, an outlier in DC. Right now, we engage, we, the United States, engage in all sorts of cyber attacks all around the globe which is destined to make us less safe over time. We also do a lot of work on additive manufacturing in DC. In DC, in Congress and et cetera, everyone's freaked out about the 3D printed gun. I hear that in every meeting that I'm ever at. What I'm much more concerned about is what happens when people are printing 3D printed car parts. What happens to tort law? What happens to intellectual property? What happens to all of the retail and supply chains that are based upon a centralized manufa manufacturing uh, sector? All of that is likely, assuming that material sciences continues to solve certain problems like the tensile strength of 3D printed materials, are likely to vex us in the coming years. Likewise, the smart vehicle, what I'm worried about here isn't, you know, oh, we get to drive in the cities and maybe a car runs over somebody, although that will certainly happen at some point. What I'm worried about is where we will see smart vehicles first is gonna be long haul trucking. And what's the number one job for men in America? Long, or trucking, it's 3.5 million people employed as truckers in America. And you can imagine in a very short time frame a goodly number of them being displaced, not in some distant future, but possibly for the next administration to have to start dealing with. And we have no plan for that. Now, trucking is the last job in thousands of communities across the United States. There's just nothing else left. Manufacturing is gone, mining is gone. This is it. When this goes, it will cause strife on a near on unprecedented scale in these communities. And finally, where I'm gonna spend most of my time today, mass surveillance. And I find this to be a battle that has been completely teed up for 2021 and is likely to be the mother of all legal legislative kerfuffles in the coming year. So somewhere along the way, we went from this famous cartoon, nobody knows you're a dog online, right? To something else, something full of facial recognition and tagging and where our innermost thoughts and privacy is being pried apart by technologies that are ever more invasive in our lives. So when I look to the tech policy battles of 2021, the crypto wars to me are front and center. What the future of communications, this medium, all the ways that we interconnect, all the devices that we use in our homes, that we carry on our bodies and soon will be in our bodies, who controls the data flow in there is of utmost importance. And keep it in mind this gulf of ignorance among the often septuagenarians and older kind of decision makers uh, should make you profoundly concerned. 
So I'll start with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA, and its genesis point, not with the current president, Trump, on the, on the right, but with Ronald Reagan on the left. Ronald Reagan, who decided that we needed to take this, this law which was focusing on national defense, right? Was focusing on, in essence, issues of security of the highest degree and switched it, in essence, to anyone accessing a computer without authorization, which leads to all sorts of problems, right? So today, stealing state secrets, hacking into like that NORAD and stealing the nuclear launch codes is treated akin to things like, you know, sharing Facebook info, right? And this is a real, this is a real case. Facebook sues Power Ventures or LinkedIn versus HiQ, which again was scraping data off of people's resumes and was brought up on charges of CFAA. Or how about this, Zillow going after McMansion Hill. I can't make this stuff up. Right? CFAA was part of a lawsuit, which thankfully Zillow lost, going after what is obviously a satire site. And they did this because they wouldn't be able to make headway on copyright, but CFAA allows them to route around that. And of course, things like too much library is what happened to my friend Aaron Schwartz, who was facing decades in prison for downloading too many library articles and was brought up on charges. There's a whole documentary on him called The Internet's Own Boy. Uh, it's a travesty what happened there, and it's CFAA that was the mechanism for doing this. And the weird thing about CFAA is its genesis point was this movie, War Games, where Reagan watches Matthew, a young Matthew Broderick hacking into things and realizes there's no law against doing this. And so Reagan's like, oh, hey, we got to pass something. So they do. They do. This really terrible, horrendous law. And into this mix, who appears none other than Joe Biden, who's like, hey, we got to do more. And so proposes this. In 1991, Joe Biden's the guy that says, hey, you know what we need? a back door for government surveillance on all communications. Unless you think this is insane, let me tell you, then we spend the next decade battling it out, right? The clipper chip gets introduced, right? There's gonna be a chip that you put onto the boards of all your devices, and it provides, in essence, a mechanism whereby the government and only the government can then access your communications, except it takes like a year, year and a half for Matt Blaze over at at Labs to figure out like how to route around this. Which is to say that skeleton key that only, only the US government is supposed to have, turns out might not be the sole person that could get the back door to all communications. Luckily, the clipper chip goes down as a failure but right afterwards, right afterwards, we pass CALEA. And CALEA is the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. And this is the rule of the land today. And it has all sorts of implications because what it mandates, what this law mandates is that all of our communications must be surveillable. And you can see what this looks like if you go into the Wayback Machine and pull up early Skype, right? Which was the Zoom of its time, as we probably remember. And you look at, oh, how do they secure their communications? And Skype, as an Estonian company, is like, hey, we're just going to use end-to-end -end encryption. Obviously, that's the way you secure communications, and that's what they will use. Well, fast forward a decade or so, Microsoft buys Skype, and lo and behold, they come up with this gobbledygook, and I'll point out the paragraph that's most important here, which is to say, this is Microsoft saying, hey, you know what, we're going to do something different. We're not going to use end-to-end. -end. And in fact, as they conclude, most messages are sent both end-to-end -end and through our cloud, but soon, in the future, 
it will only be sent via our cloud, quote, to provide the optimal user experience. Now, if anyone can figure out why you would need to route through their cloud for an optimal user experience, I would love to hear the justification, but this is because of Kalia. Now, what do you then do when you have everything that could be surveillable? Well, hopefully you go get a warrant and you do everything by the book and et cetera, but I'm not gonna show you this clip, but if you were to look at Clapper testifying before Congress under oath and being asked by Senator Wyden in March of 2013, keeping in mind that Snowden is still a couple of months into the future, you hear James Clapper say, no, the NSA doesn't collect any information at all. Well, once Snowden comes out and we realize he's been lying, he was asked about this and here was his response, right? I responded in what I thought was the most truthful or least untruthful manner. If my kids did that, they would still be sent to timeout for lying. Thus far, nothing has happened with James Clapper, but it begs the question of why is it okay for some people to lie under oath about what ends up being the world's largest surveillance program. And it's not just him, right? President Obama goes and says, hey, you know what? I'm, again, I'm not gonna show you this clip, but it'll be in the slides and you can look at it in your leisure time. But Obama goes on to the Jay Leno show and says, nope, there is no domestic spying program. which would be true unless, as these slides, which are the NSA's own slides demonstrate, you might think, well, domestically, it seems like people might use Microsoft, Google, and Facebook products, and it sounds like you're collecting information from exactly these platforms. And it sounds like, again, this is the NSA slide, you're collecting information about emails, videos, photos, stored data, VoIP, file transfers, a whole bunch of stuff via the back end, this insecure cloud that is under government mandate to be surveillable. And there's two things here. One is PRISM, but there's a whole other thing where they're saying, hey, we're, what we're actually going to do via Fairview, Stormbrew, Blarney, Oakstar, probably other programs as well, is we're going to collect all the data flowing over fiber optic cables. And again, this is the NSA slide. So they're saying, hey, you know what? You should use both. You should collect data directly from the providers and you should collect data via the fiber optic cables, the flows over our infrastructure. I don't know about you, but when I look at this slide, it sure looks like it's domestic focused. And in fact, it is. Now this gets hilarious slash very sad when you think about like, Wow, this program allegedly is what then got Trump and his campaign into big trouble for colluding with Russia. Trump hated that this was done, that this extra legal, unwarranted, there was not a warrant involved, surveillance of his campaign via these programs. And so he comes out and says, hey, you know what? This bill sucks. And he posts publicly at 4.33 a.m to the effect of this is a terrible bill. Now, if you've ever wondered how long does it take for the NSA to realize that the president has tweeted something, scramble people to brief the president, get to the White House and do so, I give you his 6.14 a.m. tweet, which completely reverses track. He's like, eh, actually, that thing I said sucked. Eh, it's not so sucky after all. And a week later, a week later, he says, hey, you know what? I reauthorized the bill, which is, gets super awkward because he's like, this is not the same FISA law. And I'm like, usually when you reauthorize something, it is the same law. And in fact, it very much is the same law. There's a couple of tweaks at the edges, but for the most part, section 702, which is the surveillance of traffic flows, has been reauthorized. Now, the Fourth Amendment has a pretty interesting history because, of course, it wasn't 1776 
when we passed the Fourth Amendment. It's 1791, and we, what happened is we fought this war in between, and we learned a lot about like what oppression looks like and built a Bill of Rights to kind of address some of the more egregious things that the Crown did during that war for independence. Amongst these is the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution, one of the most important legal safeguards saying that you can't just surveil anyone willy nilly. And the Supreme Court has even weighed in on this, basically saying like, yeah, you know what, you need to get warrants, which is what happened after COINTELPRO, uh, an earlier iteration of mass surveillance of various and sundry domestic organizations and individuals. So here's the Fourth Amendment. It's pretty clear, right? No warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, yada, yada, yada. The long story short is there's no asterisk here. There's no thing like, oh, you're going after child pornography, like you don't need to get a warrant. No, you always need to get a warrant. And if somebody would like to change this, be my guest, you could attempt to change the constitution on this. But in a nutshell, if you want to surveil somebody and your law enforcement, you need to get a warrant. So now let's fast forward to last month. All of this is going down. The Snowden files have revealed that there's this mass surveillance program. Many of us have said, hey, you know what? This program is a disaster. It's clearly illegal. It's clearly unconstitutional. And up until last month, we were told, like, you guys are crazy. Except, as it turns out, the courts agree. So on September 2nd, 2020, the courts start issuing these rulings basically saying, hey, that thing that you're doing, this bulk data collection is in fact illegal. And as you can imagine, after years, right, Snowden files are June 2013. So it's taken a goodly long time to arrive at this point. But what this means is that you need to then have a total conceptual legal framework rethink if you're gonna continue any of these surveillance programs. And of course, this gets much, 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 much worse. So one of the things buried in this court decision is this problem that the court puts its finger on, which is that criminal defendants having been brought to trial, not as terrorists, but of, as all sorts of other potential ne'er-do-wells, alleged ne'er-do-wells, using evidence collected via this system have been thrown in jail. And there's a problem, something called the fruit of the poisonous tree, a very biblical kind of notion based upon the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment says very clearly, in essence, that you can't, you can't not use rule of law that everyone by nature of being in the US is given due process. And one of the due process elements is a warrant and being able to face your accuser. And if you're collecting data via this secret mechanism and then sharing it and using it to convict people, that might be a problem. Luckily, you don't have to take my word for it because last year, the Office of the Inspector General of the United States issued their very own report a report that should raise even more concerns because they start talking about bulk data collection. And even in a post Snowden world, you can see there's huge sections of this report that are blacked out, which is to say there's probably huge numbers of other programs doing things that have yet to even see the light of day which is to say all of the problems that I'm talking about are probably much worse. We just don't know what they are yet. I love chapter five, that heading right at the top there. It's just, we know there's a chapter there. We have no idea what it's about. But buried in the midst of this report is a very problematic paragraph, which is to say, to translate, the Inspector General of the United States is troubled, which is to say they are freaked as hell at the legal problems entailed in secret surveillance programs 
being used to convict people, and they go on, which is to say that the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, is using these programs that were set up under the Patriot Act that, again, aren't supposed to target domestic people at all, and then doing something they call parallel construction. Parallel construction would be what you and I know of as lying and perjury, which is to say you've got these data, they're from a program, but you lie about where you got them from. You say, oh, the Providence is, uh, I don't know, like a confidential informant, an anonymous tip. And therefore, the person, the defendant who's been accused of a crime has no mechanism for actually defending themselves or interrogating where the evidence came from. Now, as you can imagine, this unto itself would be highly problematic, but the fruit from the poisonous tree, this legal doctrine says, look, if you get, if you get evidence illegally, it's impermissible in court. You can't use it. And the problem then is that probably thousands of Americans have been convicted based on secret evidence collected via these massive surveillance programs shared with organizations like the DEA. And I have no idea how you unwind this. What I can tell you is now that the courts have said that is all illegal, that this is gonna open up a Pandora's box into 2021. Because even if I'm guilty of sin, my logical next step as somebody convicted with evidence that may or may not have come from this program is to lay claim to say, yes, it definitely is illegally collected. Now, whether we will go that route, I don't know. I don't know how you stuff the toothpaste back into the tube. But you can see the extent of this problem when you look at things like stingrays. Stingrays are, in essence, mechanisms that look to your phones like a cell tower and collect evidence. That collect, in essence, what people are doing on a cellular network. And as you can imagine, if I set one of these up in your town and all the phones connect to it, it's not like I've gotten a warrant to collect all these different people's data. And in fact, a lot of times they don't. And as it turns out, if you were to look at say where stingrays are being used, I know this would shock you, but it turns out they're being used overwhelmingly in communities of color. Which is to say, no matter really where you look, so here's Tallahassee. In Tallahassee, you've basically got about 28% of the populace who's minority, but over 50% of the stingray use is in those communities. Baltimore is even worse. If Baltimore were a piece of pizza, you would see that like the pieces of that pizza that are black communities are where the stingrays are being used. And they've even carved out this space in between them, the whiter area of Baltimore and don't do surveillance, don't do mass surveillance, don't do unwarranted mass surveillance there. Which tells you a lot about how these technologies are being operationalized. This is a simmering time bomb, legally speaking. And the court case that was decided last, last month lights the fuse. So, if 90% of stingray incidents are occurring in non-white census block groups, you can tell exactly who is being targeted via this unwarranted mass surveillance mechanism. And chances are, chances are, a lot of the other programs are doing likewise. Another issue, because we're all full of bright and cheery thoughts this evening, would be something like this, Facebook. Here's Facebook in March of 2018. Guess what? They're in huge trouble for screwing up. In this case, it was, I believe, the Cambridge Analytica kerfuffle. Here is 2019, right, where Facebook was unable, for whatever reason, to stop the live streaming of the domestic 
in New Zealand, the Domestic Terrorist Act targeting uh, a mosque. And uh, once again, Facebook's like, oh yeah, we totally screwed that up too, but don't worry, we got this. We'll figure it out. Fast forward to this month of this year, and Facebook is once again in the news. At this point, you know, the narrative is about them uh, being biased against conservatives as, the, as it turns out, Facebook's actually been biased against like Mother Jones and other progressive news outlets. Regardless, year after year after year, Facebook keeps getting itself into major trouble. And year after year after year, Facebook is saying like, oh, hey, don't worry, we got this. And if you're wondering like how it is that they have not yet faced major repercussions in Congress, I would point you to this helpful graphic which is how much is Facebook, just Facebook, spending on lobbying just Congress? As it turns out, oh, you know, like roughly $15 million a year last year. We've only got for 2020 the first three quarters. So they're almost equal in 2020 to what they spent the entirety of 2019. Chances are this will be a bellwether year, north of 17 million, probably closer to $20 million being spent to lobby literally just 535 people, right? This doesn't include such things as like the FCC, the Federal Trade Commission, or all of the other ways in which Facebook is investing in Congress critters, all of those campaign donations and et cetera. And if you expand this to look at internet companies writ large, well, you would see that they're spending on average around, what, 50, 60 million dollars a year just lobbying Congress. That's a whole lot of lobbyists for a very few number of people. And I can tell you for a fact, because I'm up there occasionally, they're there every day. And this is, in essence, what we're up against. But it's not just Congress. Those numbers, of course, completely ignore what's happening in other agencies like the Federal Communications Commission, where Ajit Pai, the current FCC chairman, a chairman that was appointed by Barack Obama in 2012, a lot of people mistakenly think that somebody who's this anti-network neutrality was a Trump appointee. That is not the case. Trump just elevated him. He was put there by Obama. And Pi is totally against network neutrality. Thinks it's a mistake, really wants self-regulation self by the industry, is wholeheartedly behind the corporatist approach, the laissez-faire political approach, the light regulation approach. And, you know, also just happens to have been one of the top lawyers for Verizon before he was FCC chairman. But it's not just Pi. If anyone knows this guy, uh, this is Michael Powell. He is the last, the former uh, FCC, Republican FCC chairman. He left the FCC to become the head of lobbying, the president of the cable industry lobbying group. He went from regulating cable industry to running their lobbying group. Can't make this stuff up. Here's Meredith Baker. She's the one who, who cast the deciding vote in the Comcast NBC Universal merger and then left early from her posting as an FCC commissioner to take up a senior VP job with the newly formed Comcast NBC Universal. So if you look up her resume, it's straight from FCC to Comcast, having enabled them to become ever richer by casting the vote to allow them to merge. Unless you think that I'm just picking on the Republicans, here's the last Democratic FCC commissioner, uh, FCC chairman, sorry. Uh, this is Tom Wheeler. He went to the FCC and was the former head of lobbying for the cable industry, which is to say he and Michael Powell just kind of do si -do Now, were this Russia, and this were happening, we would simply call it corruption. But this is happening right now, and it's an open question, right? 
whether when people are talking about draining the swamp, when people are talking about getting rid of lobbyists out of government, it's an open question what 2021 will bring us and whether this kind of status quo, this revolving door will continue. I can tell you right now, people are gearing up for a huge battle because each of these individuals has to be confirmed and I expect there to be fireworks in Congress in 2021. If on the other hand, you're looking at say antitrust, Facebook, Google, all the big folks, you're looking towards the Federal Trade Commission. And let me tell you, mergers and acquisitions have been a big thing, a trillion dollars a year these days. And even post COVID, if you look at this, you will see that we have completely recovered in the mergers and acquisition industry from the slump of March and April and May. We are definitely on target for another trillion dollar mergers and acquisition year during a time of fairly unprecedented economic slowdown, m and is robust. And this consolidation in antitrust has been pretty popular with the masses to the point that John Oliver uh, has a great screed about just how detrimental this has been to consumers. But the fact remains that like the FCC, the FTC is doing much the same thing. So what happened to say FTC Commissioner John Leibowitz? Well, he left the FTC to start helping folks work on antitrust. And trust me, he's not helping public interest folks with this. No, if you actually look at what he's running, things like the 21st Century Privacy Coalition, you can see who the members of this privacy coalition that pays his rent are. Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, Time Warner, etc. This is who he represents. Or how about Julie Brill? Julie Brill was an FTC commissioner that ostensibly cared about privacy, but doesn't do anything about it when she was in office. She had her one year mandatory timeout at uh, a law firm before then becoming a senior VP at Microsoft. And lest you think this was not dripping enough with irony, here is her posting from this month as Microsoft's new privacy chief saying, hey, we really got to do something about greater consumer data protection. And she's one of the only people on the planet that actually could have done something for greater consumer data protection and chose not to during her multi-year tenure as an FTC commissioner. Edith Ramirez, it's much the same story, right? Edith Ramirez went to the same law firm uh, as and she was former chairman of the FTC. And if you look at what she's doing now, I don't know how well this comes out for you guys, but she, this is the quote from her bio, quote, she is able to help companies navigate competition, privacy, and data security issues in the US. Now it doesn't take a genius to decode this, but in essence, she's like, hey, I'll help you avoid the government actually holding you to account and you will pay me Boku bucks. And this is the status quo, the quid pro quo. This is Democrats and Republicans alike. And it's a real problem. I think this becomes a much bigger kerfuffle into 2021, and I'll show you why. So some of us remember the browser wars. This is when Microsoft started bundling Internet Explorer in with its operating system. It, in 2001, after multiple years, had a court case. You can see the rise and fall of Internet Explorer, this blue section of this chart. You can see the exact moment when the courts rule that this is unfair, anti-competitive, and you're going to have to stop doing that. And the reason why that, that, that uh, cartoon is funny is that, well, when you look at what's happened since then, Take a look at this green line. So as the blue is dying, Internet Explorer is going to nothingness. The green, that would be Chrome and Google. 
And what are they doing? Well, I don't know, take a look at your phone and chances are you've got an Android phone or an Apple phone, both of which bundle their browsers with their operating system, even though the legal precedent is to say, no, you can't do that. In fact, that is illegal anti-competitive behavior. Well, they're laughing all the way to the bank at this point in time. As you can see, this has been going on for quite a long time. And if you've been following the news, you know that Trump is kind of angry at all the social media, big tech, Silicon Valley firms. So ironically, the Republican FTC has actually been pushing forward supposedly, on a bunch of antitrust things. So Facebook is facing an antitrust case that supposedly is going to go public any moment now. So is Google, which actually has now a lawsuit against it. And all of this is likely to play out into 2021. I'm looking for the legal explosions, but I'm also looking for a lot of legislative uh, tilting at windmills to try to fix this problem, usually at the behest of those tens of millions of dollars being spent on lobbyists. I would look to a bumper crop of lobbyists descending on Congress in 2021 in order to kind of head these regulatory issues off. It will be a huge battle because, of course, the companies being targeted are amongst the largest on the planet by market capitalization. So my guess is there's going to be an antitrust investigation. It's important to remember that Google was investigated once before by the FTC. That FTC overrode the recommendation of its own staff saying they should investigate this in order not to investigate it. That was under the Obama administration. There's probably going to be some improved algorithmic discrimination protections. There's likely to be some consumer data protection legislation for Internet of Things and other things of that ilk. There's almost assuredly going to be antitrust investigations of Amazon's publishing. Stronger privacy protections. We're already seeing that coming out of California. The New York Assembly is looking at something similar. Obviously, the EU has already passed some uh, in GDPR, we'll probably do something. I don't know how good or not. Telco price gouging investigation, almost assuredly. Safe Harbor, this is that Section 230 battle royale that's playing out as we speak. But mainly, even though this all seems like, oh, hey, things are going to happen, what I anticipate is a very long procrastination and perseveration amongst all the people in DC, which is to say, whereas the evidence of o is overwhelming that something is dreadfully wrong in these sectors, moving people to actually do something, that's going to be difficult. And in essence, what I think we're going to see a lot of is a, a sort of a meta battle, like how do we fight the stagnation, right? And in many ways, it doesn't matter. So let's say Trump wins on Tuesday. Well, it turns out lobbyists are pretty much running a lot of the key positions in his campaign. And they're doing that because they expect to be put into positions in his administration in 2021. Now, lest you think there is a white, a white knight here, let me just say, like, turns out the Biden campaign is completely overrun with lobbyists too. Which is to say, no matter what happens on Tuesday, the lobbying industry has hedged its bets, and no matter who wins, is likely to hold key positions in the next administration, which makes all of these battles uh, even more protracted. So that's before, and I have to basically uh, summarize a couple of issues here because I don't have time to go into them. That's before we get into, say, like the global pandemic, not zombies as I had long suspected would be our downfall, but rather coronavirus bringing to the fore the need for there to be ex extensive investment and expansive uh, expansion 
of broadband connectivity. Here's me back in the day when we used to do keynotes uh, in suits, uh, climbing around afterwards to install some networks. But when I look around the nation, we're seeing all sorts of community networking initiatives, DIY initiatives, basically acts of desperation, acts of like, we need something in our homes because if we don't, we can't participate in the civic life, social life, economic life of a post COVID civilization. And so no matter where you're looking from Philadelphia and my backyard here, all across the country, we're seeing all sorts of new broadband initiatives springing up and the government hopefully at some point will get its act together to actually invest in this. We've been watching as about 50 to $100 billion in broadband investment has languished in Congress for the past year. There have been a half dozen bills that have attempted to pass something, none of them have gone anywhere. And all of that is of course, before we get into all these other issues that are in the news, that will certainly also be spinning up into 2021. Uh, none the least of which is the lack of any meaningful consumer protections involved with the Internet of Things. So hacks are now pretty much endemic. They're happening all the time. Here's a listing. I just chose one per month because there's just so many. But when you look, it's like, oh, if you've used everything from Microsoft, T-Mobile, Facebook, if you're <laughs> Sadly, in the U.S. Marshals uh, database, you got hacked there too. Ancestry, Instagram, Staples, so many different things have been hacked this year. Usually, these would each be front page news, but this year has been so freaking crazy that most people don't even know that these problems exist. And of course, when you start adding these numbers up, you realize, wow, this is like hundreds of millions of people affected by these hacks that didn't even make page one of most news coverage. And you can get into all sorts of other stuff. Copyright is looming in the background. We haven't had an extension battle for a number of years, but 2023 is a bellwether year that's coming up quickly. So I am anticipating that there will be movement to once again extend the limited time of copyright to an ever increasingly absurd epoch. It's now 95 years. And of course, surveillance and all of these systems got their, their start, their foothold, uh, their, their beachhead surveilling for pirates. Remember before all this, pirates were the doom uh, the, the horses of the apocalypse that were going to bring us all down. Copyright's gotten increasingly absurd. I would love to see a battle over copyright in 2021. We'll see. We haven't even touched on network neutrality, which now that Ajit Pai has basically said, hey, you know what? We're getting rid of all those privacy protections, all of those consumer protections. We're basically allowing people to create a non-neutral transport network and again, this is Tuesday of this week where he reaffirmed this stance. So you can imagine this is going to be a big battle, especially, especially if you end up with a new FCC being constituted in 2021. Look for this and look for Congress to attempt to o potentially override the FCC in order to prevent them from protecting you. We'll see. And then there's big data, privacy, consumer rights, all sorts of other issues that are at play here. Keeping in mind that in my book, Dilbert's boss is the equivalent of a Congress critter. His understanding of technology seems to me to parallel that of far too many folks that are actually making the laws of the land today. So, there is a quarter century plus of mortgage decision making regarding what's actually real technologically and a zillion different battles that are going to come to the fore in 2021 for a variety of reasons. 
but it will be a critical juncture. This next administration will be dealing with the fact that we just can't kick the, the can down the, the street any longer. And why we do this? Well, you know, there's one school of thought that's like we're doing it because this is what we, academics, scientists, technologists, should be doing in the world. I have that plus I think there's another reason to do this, which is that the world that we're leaving to the first generations that will spend their entire lives in a digitally mediated civilization, right now we're on a very bleak trajectory. And as a father, <laughs> that's not the world that I wanna leave behind. So what motivates me in many regards is, for me, this is a place where I might have a meaningful impact on bettering the lives of my daughter which drives me, not the fame, not the fortune, but this drives me to continue to fight battles that are often Don Quixote-esque in terms of having to tilt at windmills again and again and again. So with that, I will draw to a close. Thank you, here's my contact information. There's a quick link to the slides if you wanna go and see some of the embedded media that's there or just refresh your memory on what the heck I just said. I'll open it up now, Dustin, to you and others for any questions that you might have. Yeah, thanks. This, this was great. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you're describing this kind of ecosystem of, you know, pressure, you know, this kind of ecology of like actors and institutions. Um, and I mean, there, I kept writing down sort of notes and questions as you were speaking, but I, I think to start with, I think the, the sort of, um, to go back to one of your, the kind of early point you're talking about trying to bring technologists into the room uh, around policy issues. Um, I, I think to what degree does the sort of, uh, the, the situate, the use, the reliance on digital technology, um, change the nature of policy making, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, or, or maybe what you, how you'd like to see things change, you know, it's, um, or the nature of, yeah, I mean, just like what, you know, since you're, you were talking about how there's so many lawyers involved, right, in DC, and with uh, the sort of policy making process, but and it, it, to me, it seems like this kind of frog and boiling water kind of situation, right? Where like this sort of tech, you know, sort of technology driven sort of regimes of surveillance have kind of emerged around without even a kind of, without a clear reflection on how to regulate them, right? In an effective way. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that's not, that's not a clear question, more as a kind of open-ended kind of, uh, sort of comment, um, but yeah, I, I, I think the 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 other the other sort of thing that comes to mind is um, you know this to what extent you know you you started you were focusing on um, sort of government surveillance and then you kind of pivot towards the end talking about sort of you know corporate sort of surveillance data collection practices. And to what degree do these kinds of um, practices sort of enable each other or kind of, you know, and like that, and that there's this kind of tension that you're kind of illustrating in terms of the individual, this kind of revolving door of individuals there. But there's also this kind of um, issue of like the design of technology itself, right? Um, like what uh, sort of conventions and best practices and so on, right? I, I don't know. That's, that's my sort of initial brain dump for you. And I think it's, you've put your finger on something that I think is really important, which is that the corporate surveillance and the government surveillance have now become entirely intertwined, right? So I'll give you another example, which is when Amazon bought Ring, the doorbell company, right, that takes photos of everyone, one of the things that they created was this two-sided market. So on the one hand, they're selling these rings to consumers. And on the other hand, they're selling these data collected via ring to police departments, over 600 of 
And so what is corporate surveillance and what is government surveillance? I would argue that these things are inextricably tied together. And some of the more recent legislation makes that very clear where the government is paying companies to do surveillance on you, the consumer, and then the companies are voluntarily handing over these data to the government. But once you've created a revenue stream for these companies, it's very difficult to be like, no, I'm going to forego this. Mm. And, you know, I would argue, of course, that functionally that is a way to route around getting a warrant and should be disallowed. But this ends up in this legal kind of gray area. At some point, a court has to weigh in and be like, so it doesn't really matter how this is operationalized. The function is what matters. And right now we're living in a society whereby the companies and the government is, you know, again, this would have been tinfoil hat wearing kind of stuff 10 years ago. But after Snowden, it's like, no, no, this is established fact. Everyone's working collaboratively to swap this information. And they're doing it for all sorts of reasons. Profits, yes. Surveillance, yes. Oppression, absolutely. And on and on. This isn't, by the way, all that different from what happened in the mechanistic era of COINTELPRO, which is to say, when you look at the FBI identifying black identity extremism as a threat to the country, which was mind boggling to anyone that looks at the data, because you're like, I don't think that's really where the problem is. But this then is used to justify why we got to do all this surveillance of communities of color. And it's the companies that are facilitating that, unfortunately. Sure. I mean, in terms of, I mean, the identity politics side of things or sort of intersectionality sort of dynamics, right? You have kind of a, this kind of vicious kind of recursive issue of kind of systems sort of re reproducing sort of bias, biases that were already in place, you know, before the technologies themselves, right? Were, and, and it, you know, there's, there's kind of, long-term sort of potential risks with all of that. Um, yeah, no, it, so, it, so it, it's, the, but what you're saying before, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea in terms of the kind of, kind of hand in hand sort of interests of sort of profit motives versus secu national security. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that came to mind while you were speaking is like, to just to take sort of the devil's advocate, you know, the counter position is like, well, you know, okay, there are sort of potentially real national security motivations for, for implementing some of these systems and tools, right? Obviously, you know, and how do you strike that balance in terms of protecting civil liberties? But like even, let, let, you know, a more pressing, more immediate sort of example of, of this would be like, uh, say like COVID, Right. And contact tracing apps and like the sort of ability for, um, say, like public health organizations to collect information. And um, and, you know, that's a situation where hopefully, you know, we can have faith in sort of public regional public health authorities that they are trying to do. You know, it's, it's kind of gov good. It's 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 good government. Right. It's like, you know, trying to serve the interests of uh, of the population. Um, but there's still this kind of tension there. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I trying to, I guess to me, it feels like we lack a sort of a kind of critical language for talking about issues of surveillance and data collection. Right. Cause it's like, it's either it's, I think when it is kind of evoked, it's often described as like an infringement on civil liberties and like, it's just kind of a general sort of, description of this kind of like all surveillance is the same and maybe there are differences that we need to be able to sort of talk about right that like you know the NSA eavesdropping on everybody is going to be different than you know your regional health you know uh, public health department sort of trying to co coordinate in response to a pandemic but yeah it's, I, I don't know what, what what what's your take on on that yeah so you know in statistics when we're running an experiment, we're, we're looking for, you know, some sort of effect. And we're also reporting out type one and type two errors, right? False positives and false negatives. In surveillance, we don't do that. 
So how, like a false positive that we're all familiar with would be when your credit card falsely thinks that you're engaged in a fraudulent activity when you go and buy like jelly beans. This happened to me and I'm like, I have to call up the company and be like, no, it's me. I bought the jelly beans, please put this charge through, right? This happens again all the time in surveillance. And we've seen a lot of stories around, you know, false, you know, facial recognition leading to somebody being wrongfully arrested. We see it all the time in terms of false flagging the wrong individual, wrong group, wrong place. That's different than say the false negative, which is where you think somebody is not a terrorist, but in fact they are. Every mass shooting would be an example of a false negative getting through our mega surveillance system. Um, those numbers aren't reported out. I've been trying for five years now to get Congress to adopt kind of this best practice from the statistical field to say like, hey, then we would know how efficacious are these programs. But right now what happens, and the ruling on September 2nd is a great example. If you wanna read something that's pretty damning, uh, originally this bulk data collection was justified by the NSA and others as saying like, well, we've caught hundreds of terrorists using, using this, these data. And so a bunch of Congress folks were like, oh, show us you know, who, who they were. They're like, oh, it's, oh, it's more like, like 50, 54. Uh, and it kept getting wheedled down. And New America, my, my colleagues did a whole analysis of the public records of terrorists that have been convicted to look to see if we could find any that had been convicted based upon this program data. And we could only find one case where that might have been true, and it was this case. And in this case, this September 2nd ruling, they say, look, the information used as part of the prosecution of these folks was wrongfully, illegally collected. But even when we throw it out, it had no bearing on the guilty conviction which is to say the last case that we knew of that was being used to justify this program, a judge basically said, this evidence is irrelevant to mm -hmm. their conviction. And so again, we don't have all the information, but what information we have is that these programs have been spectacularly ineffective. Mm. And I and many others have said like, hey, we actually need to audit this stuff. Like we can't even have a conversation about like, are the trade-offs worthwhile? What we can say is you've provided no justification that there's any trade-off worth making here. And the same goes for contact tracing. Contract tracing needs about a 60 plus percent adoption rate to be in any way effective. And when you look at like how many people have adopted like the contact tracing apps on their phones, it's like under 1% which is to say you're giving up privacy, but you're not actually getting a public health benefit at all from this. And again, I would love to be at the point where we can have a conversation about how effective these programs are versus what we're being asked to give up for them. That would be progress in my mind. In the interim, I think it's crazy that we accept that these things are somehow doing something having an, a positive impact when all the evidence that's been brought to bear thus far has demonstrated quite the opposite. And as somebody that's worked with a lot of whistleblowers and former CIA analysts and et cetera, what they'll say is we are now completely inundated with false positives. We get stuff all the time and it's swamping our ability to pursue good old gumshoe kind of work that we're less efficacious because we're deluged with data. Mm -hmm. And again, there's this notion that if we collect more information, we'll somehow get more accurate. But in statistics, there's a phenomenon called the ecological fallacy, which basically says you can't take population level data and distill it down to an individual. And the problem is there's this assumption that there's a profile for a bad guy. A terrorist looks like something. And if we just had enough data, we could identify them. And that may, in fact, not be the case at all. Hmm. That, so something that comes to mind as well is um, sort of you, you talk, is, is the sort of international dynamic around this? I mean, your work sort of 
you know, in DC, you know, and thinking about national policies tends to just by its nature kind of frame things in terms of national sort of na sort of national sort of uh, outcomes and goals and sort of and the sort of mechanisms of sort of national policy making. But the um, obviously the big tech companies are operating sort of internationally, and you're talking about um, you know GDPR uh, towards the end. You briefly mentioned that, right? There, that's an interesting example, right, of like where you have some private, privacy regulations that are so sort of a, potentially expensive or have such reach on these companies that they start to implement them just globally as the standards, right? Or to, so there's a kind of interesting sort of, um, sort of the, the kind of sovereignty, the influence of different nation states kind of plays out in this kind of complicated way when we're talking about these on the kind of online ecosystem of different platforms and internet service providers and so on. Um, yeah, it, it gets totally crazy, right? I mean, so it's not just foreign countries because California just passed the CCPA, right? So now all of a sudden you've got a state where the privacy laws governing how a company can collect and utilize data are different than the other 49 states. And, you know, because it's 40 odd million people there, that's gonna have an impact we just don't know what that looks like. The U.S. is an outlier in terms of a lack of many of the basic protections that one would expect to find. And internationally, this gets super messy super quickly. So right now we've got you know, the U.S. taking TikTok to task for potentially sharing data with the Chinese government literally in the same month that the EU is ruling that Facebook has been illegally sharing data with the U.S. government. And, you know, the reality is like, there's just a hot mess of legal insanity at this moment in time. And it's been mortgaged, mortgage, mortgage, mortgage. But you can see how all of these different battles over GDPR is a great example are just now coming to like a head. And they're doing this kind of all at the same time across a whole bunch of different domains. What does it mean? It means that probably you're going to see other venues, whether it's Canada or the EU, the Dutch, whoever, passing far more, I would call them consumer protective laws. And then companies being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Kalia is still the lay of the land they still must make their communications surveillable at the same time that GDPR is saying you must not make your communications surveillable. How you square that, I don't know. Right, there's, there, there's just these uh, unresolvable tensions that sort of exist playing out. Yeah, no, it'll... Uh, uh, I, I w I've just been spending some time looking at sort of human rights documents like the UN and, you know, and the increasingly there's sort of language there about, and like a call to sort of talk about internet access as a human right. And, but it also seems to be still incredibly vague in terms of like how, what does, what does that involve, right? Like access, like in a very abstract sense is just very, you know, it's, it's a very two dimensional sort of way of describing the situation. Right. And so, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I, I think, I think at this point, if, if anybody else has any questions, please, uh, let us know. You can write it in the chat or, you know, just chime in. Um, you know, I, I think I've, I've, I've made, I've kind of gone over most of my notes and, and, and questions, but this was really great. This was, it was really interesting. You, you covered a lot of material, a really interesting sort of big picture sort of presentation. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, um, okay. No, no questions as of yet. So, all right. Well, thanks. Thanks uh, for, for presenting. It yeah, was, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll be in touch. Okay. Wonderful. Take okay. care, everyone. Bye-bye.